Good morning, Crossroads. Uh, so thankful to be with you this morning. Thanks, Luke. To gather together. Uh, I'm just so thankful for the church and the gift that it is that we get to gather together to celebrate things that are going on in life, to, to journey with each other as things get hard, and also um, to come alongside each other when there's something to mourn. And today we do have something to mourn. Uh, this week, Mark Veeger passed away. And I just want to take some time to pray uh, for the family. Uh, and if you have uh, anything you need to process after service, I would sure be willing to come alongside and speak with you. But let's just take a moment here as we begin coming together just to pray for that family. Father, we just come before you humbly and with open hands and just ask that you would come alongside all those impacted. God, we know that your word says that you are near to the brokenhearted, Lord, that you bring healing to those in need. God, we're so thankful that you are this kind of God. God, we pray for peace and for healing in that family as they mourn this loss. Lord, I pray that there would be people that would come alongside them as they go through this time. Lord, help us to lean into you, to trust you, to find our hope in you, no matter what happens in our life. God, we so thank you for all the ways that you graciously come alongside us and care for us in all different types of circumstances and all needs that we may have. God, you're so good. We thank you and we love you. In your name, amen. Well, this morning, before we get going, I did last week promise that we would have a little halftime break with some popsicles, and this week, it is for real. We have some eager helpers uh, that are in the back, and they're going to start working their way forward. If you would like a freeze pop this morning, a little bit of sugar to get you through this next segment of the morning, uh, just lift your hand up or as they come by, just accept one as they bring it. They're working their way up. But before we do that, I just want you to take a minute and say hello to those around you and greet one another before we get into God's Word. Go ahead and do that now.
All right, go ahead and find your seats. All right, hope you guys got all sugared up. There are plenty. So if you didn't get one yet, go ahead and raise your hand and they'll find you. They'll come around. Well, what a beautiful morning. God has been so good. This is the third week in a row. Not a cloud in the sky. Just incredible. So thankful that we get to come together, have some fun this summer, sit outside, enjoy this beautiful weather. And hopefully you'll join us at the park after. Looking forward just to hanging out a little bit more. We all got to eat, right? So we might as well hang out and do it together. So glad to have you with us this morning. We're going to continue in our series of Kingdom Stories. But the question I want to start off with this week, and you don't need to raise your hand, because I understand you might not want to raise your hand on this one. Maybe you will, though. Maybe you'll be all excited about it. But the question I want to ask you this morning is, how many of you kind of enjoy, and maybe you wouldn't want to admit it, but deep down inside, seeing people get what they deserve? Yeah, you can think of a moment, a time. Boy, I, I was, me and Caitlin were driving down to Otana just a couple weeks ago, and I could see in my rearview mirror, this guy was just flying around back and forth, weaving in and out. And when that happens, I kind of just stay where I'm at. I don't always get over because I'm like, hey, man, you do whatever you're going to do, and I'm just going to chill right here. And he was weaving and dodging. He blew right by us. I don't know how he fit between us and that semi we were passing, but he did it. And then about a 30 seconds later, I see behind me the lights going. And I'm like, yes, this is going to happen. So I get over in the right lane, get out of the way, and I watch, and I look up ahead. And about a minute later, kind of a lot of brake lights in front of me because he had to pull the guy over, right? And I saw him kind of like hide in the right lane, try to be like, oh, no, no, that wasn't me, trying to hide and get away. But, you know, there's just that satisfaction of like, got him. And he pulled him over, we drive past, and there he is, and it's like, all right, there we go. But the funny thing is, we get this like satisfaction. All right, we're going to try here. All right, we're going to switch over. I think my battery's died, so sermon's over. No, 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 we're good. <laughs> and everyone was happy. That's the most amens we've had all summer. Uh, but there's so much satisfaction in seeing that happen and seeing people, you know, get what they deserve. Maybe you're thinking that right now when my batteries run out two minutes in, right? And you just get that feeling, and it's just something that we think. But the funny thing is, like, when I saw the guy get pulled over, it's not like I'm a perfect driver. But it's easy in my mind to be like, what? Well, I, I didn't get pulled over today, or I don't get pulled over very often, or I, I don't get speeding tickets, right? So it starts with, he got what he deserved, and then it usually morphs into, because I'm so much better, right? And we start to get on our high horse, like, I'm better than that guy. And this is what Jesus is going to talk to us about this morning, because so often we get these words in our head, like, I'm just glad that's not me. I'm glad I'm not that guy. I'm so much better than that guy. I'm above that guy in some way. And it start, maybe it doesn't come out of our mouth, but it's certainly in our mind and our heart. And in today's kingdom story, Jesus wants to help us break free from that mindset to just more clearly see how we should think about ourselves so that we can find humility. Because in Jesus' world, in the kingdom of God, it's not the proud that are justified, it's the humble that stand righteous before God. And Jesus wants us to see that so clearly this morning. So we've been going through these kingdom stories, and we've been trying to answer this question, just two questions. One, how do we get into the kingdom of God? But then two, how should we live inside the kingdom of God? How does one live inside the kingdom of God? How does one dress or speak or walk or love one another or coexist? How should we be in the kingdom of God? These are the two questions that Jesus' parables are answering. And, and one of the questions that I think of when we think about what unique community you might be a part of is what posture should you have? Now, I say posture, of course, I could mean physical posture, but also sort of a mindset that you might need to have in a particular community. So take the military, for example. If you're in the military, posture is very important, right? You need to be able to stand at attention, be straight up and down. You can't just be kind of slouching over, right, going through the motions. You can't walk like lackadaisically. You've got to march. You've got to be up. You have to have certain posture. Your mindset is that you're ready to obey and follow the command. Or maybe you're in a symphony orchestra, Posture is pretty important there, right? You can't just be slouching. If you want your instrument to play a beautiful sound and succeed, you need to be up on the front of your seat, arms out and up and ready to go. 
It matters our posture for us to thrive in a certain situation that we're in. This is important to us. And in the kingdom of God, the posture that Jesus is saying that we need to have for us to succeed and thrive in his kingdom is a posture of humility. In every interaction, every situation that we might come into, we need to be prepared for that situation by having the proper posture, and that posture is one of humility. And that's what Jesus is going to teach us this morning not pride. So our big idea this morning, if you want to follow along in the notes, if you're in the fill in the blanker, uh, this is perfect moment for you because the big idea on that front page is that humility is the appropriate posture in the kingdom of God. Humility is the appropriate posture in the kingdom of God. This is how we can be prepared for whatever might come in God's kingdom. Now, just to be clear right off the bat, I am not at all teaching this because I am the most humble person in all of the land. <laughs> that is not how this works. I do not gain my authority from my outstanding humility. You know, I, I'm a proud person who is trying to pursue humility by the grace of God. And just like you, I'm just kind of journeying through this life and trying to become more and more like Christ every single day. Uh, but this morning, I'm just thankful that we get to come to God's word and he gets to instruct us on his authority for how we should live in the kingdom and what kind of posture we should have. So let's just pray before we open God's word. God, we pray this morning that as we open your word and we come to interact with it, God, that we would experience you, we would see you, we would learn who you are and how to be like you. God, help us to see so clearly what it means to have a posture of humility in your kingdom. God, we're so thankful that you teach us and instruct us and don't leave us on our own to figure it out. We're thankful for your word. We ask that it would speak to us clearly this morning. In your name, amen. All right, so let's open up. We are going to be in Luke 18 today, starting in verse 9 and going through 14. That's right, only five verses this morning. So we're going to have some fun, a little uh, bite-sized sermon here. So Luke 18, 9. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning as we come to learn from God. I want to just start by going back to this very interesting opening line in verse 9. Because Luke makes his intentions really clear for why he's telling this story, and he does this for a lot of his parables. It says, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable, right? Jesus, as we've talked about, very artfully crafts these stories to target us. He knows all the different ways that we as humans struggle to live in accordance to his word and how we should be in the kingdom of God. So he knows pride is going to be a challenge. So Luke says he spoke targetedly, to us, those that look confidently upon their own righteousness and then look down on others. He does this in other places. If you just look up, if you have your Bible out, you go a few verses up, he's got a parable on prayer and he starts it off and Luke says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. I love just the clarity that, that Luke gives to just very clearly help us see this is why we're here. So we all know why we're here today. We're here today because there are some of us, let's be honest, all of us, that at times look to our own accomplishments, our own abilities to seek the righteousness that we desire, and then we look down on others and we think less of them. We try to elevate ourselves. So Jesus is speaking to us this morning. Now, how should we understand this parable? It's, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. But the one thing I always bump up against when I'm reading a parable like this is we just, it's hard for us to relate to Pharisees and tax collectors. Like, if, if I'm trying to put myself in this story and understand what Jesus is saying, he was speaking to this culture at this time. So how can we understand and put ourselves in this story so that it convicts us and speaks to us? And I was thinking a good comparison would be this. So imagine Jesus is telling this parable, and he starts it off, and he says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a long-standing member of the church, 
who's been on all the committees, done, served many, many years, done all of the practices, been very much a part of it, very engaged in what's going on, right? And the other, now a tax collector being someone who looked down upon in society that people are just frustrated, annoyed by, um, hasn't come and been a part of the religious practice regularly, right? So imagine that we had someone in town, because I don't want to pick anyone out, right, to be the bad guy and put a hat on him, and then everyone's like, oh, can you believe what Pastor said? So let's imagine that we have this guy who's going around town. Let's just call him the painter. And he's got his spray paint out, and he puts his favorite artwork on City Hall, on the side of M State, on the Otter, on everything you can possibly think of all around town. And, and everyone knows who it is, and we're frustrated, and it just keeps happening. And we're like, I can't believe this guy. I cannot believe what he's doing. Did you see what he put on the front of the church? It's unbelievable, right? This just keeps happening, and everyone knows, and everyone's frustrated. And this is how people felt about the tax collector. Right? This person that you know is taking advantage of you, that no one likes, that doesn't come and be a part of what we're doing here at church ever. So imagine we have the longtime member in the church, and we're going to call him the painter. Right, And Jesus is trying to help us see a lesson with these two characters. So we have this longtime member. And what Jesus is trying to say is, even someone who's been here a long time, who's very much a part of what's going on, even them, they are not immune from having an incorrect posture. It is possible for them to walk in with a slouch, to walk in in a way that they don't have the humility that they need to have when they're in the kingdom of God and a part of what Jesus is trying to describe. And in fact, it's actually, I think, so much easier when you are someone who has been a part of following God, a longtime member in the church, coming most weeks, serving all these things, to over time believe that somehow your righteousness or your standing before God is a result of just your years of service, your commitment to the church, your position on a leadership team, whatever it is that you feel like you've done for God. It's so easy to be tempted to believe that this is the thing that's contributing to my standing before God. And Jesus wants to make it very clear as he tells a different version of this story. That while these things are good, and we should desire to do them, they do not earn us favor with the Lord or contribute to our standing before him or our salvation. Salvation is given to the hearts of the humble and the repentant regardless of our accomplishments, regardless of our years of service. Then we have the painter. And this is someone who, who, like I said, almost rarely or never comes and attends. Someone who's looked down upon and frustrated by in society, And Jesus says, if a person like this comes before God with a repentant, respectful heart, he's God-honoring, he's humble, his posture is correct, then God will receive him and he will exalt him. So Jesus gives these very unexpected parallel examples to help us kind of go against what we would expect, what we would assume would happen in everyday life because he's trying to make a point. Now, I want to be clear, though, Jesus is not saying in any way in this parable that being a 30-year member of a church means that you absolutely have a prideful heart or that coming off the street into a church means that you automatically have a humble heart. He just wants us to use the proper measuring stick, and the only sufficient measuring stick that we can use is to to determine our standing before God is the work of Christ on the cross and the grace that he lovingly extends towards us. And our understanding of this is reflected in the condition of our heart and our posture before God. So we can see by our posture before God, if we are understanding this, if we are getting it, if we have that humility in our lives. We can see it as clearly as you could see a soldier who's just slouching over in line compared to all the other soldiers who are standing upright and straight. So I want to just make two observations this morning about this story. The first truth, if you're following along in your notes, is this. A pursuit of righteousness motivated by pride instead of grace-fueled humility is an abomination to the Lord. That was a lot. I want to say it one more time. A pursuit of righteousness motivated by pride instead of grace-fueled humility is an abomination to the Lord. Now, what do I mean by abomination? What I'm trying to say here is if you're trying to stand before God on your own and impress him, or if you're trying to come and stand next to him and be like him or be equal to him by your own efforts, this is something that God hates. He cannot stand. 
He does not like it. And scripture bears that out so clearly for us. I just want to walk through a few examples of this because the thing about pride and the reason Jesus is preaching against this is pride is at the core of all the other sin in our life. It's the thing that leads us to every other decision that's going to be sinful before God. We go all the way back in scripture to the very beginning to the garden with Adam and Eve and we can see this so clearly. If we go to Genesis 3, it says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God said you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And here comes the serpent. And he says, well, you will not certainly die. That can't be right. For here's the thing. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like him, knowing good and evil. Here is the lie that comes in. The prideful part is that you can be like God. So at the very beginning when sin enters the world, it enters in through this pride, through this desiring to be like God. And we go back even earlier than that. We see later in scripture this description in Isaiah of Satan falling from heaven. That he had this desire to be like God. In Isaiah 14, 14 it says, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Satan has this desire to be just like God, to be equal to him, and to accomplish this on his own. And the end result was that he had to fall. Pride comes before the fall, as the Bible says. And this is a perfect example of this. When pride enters into our hearts, all kinds of other things happen as a result. There's these consequences in our lives. Because when we stand before God with pride, there's nothing more than that that God dislikes and wants to clearly re-guide us and direct us and show us another way. One more example of this is in Proverbs 6. Proverbs is going through some various things that the Lord detests. It says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And the very first one on the list says, haughty eyes. Now, haughty eyes, I don't know about you guys, but I don't walk around town going like, do you have haughty eyes? Like, this is not a phrase that we use very often. What, what is this meaning, haughty eyes? Is there some mascara for that? I hope not. That would be interesting. Maybe there is. But haughty eyes is essentially like, an arrogant posture of superiority or disdain. So you're, you're basically communicating to others around you that you have this arrogance, this pride welled up in you. And the start of this list the thi- of the things that God hates is this haughty eyes, this prideful posture. And it goes on to talk about a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood and a heart that devises wicked schemes and feet that are quick to rush into evil and a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict. All these things that are not great, but at the very beginning, at the very core of all of it, is this prideful posture that the Bible says that God hates above all else. God does not like pride, and it is at the core of all of our sin. But also the Bible teaches us that we cannot contend with God, nor should we try. We should not try to be like him. When I ask this question, why? Why does God hate pride? C.J. Mahaney in his book, Humility, a very short read, I highly recommend. Several of my thoughts today come from this book. He says, pride is when sinful human beings aspire to the status and position of God and refuse to acknowledge their dependence on him. I love that. That's so helpful. That's in your notes if you want to see it. In front of you, pride is when sinful human beings aspire to the status and position of God and refuse to acknowledge their dependence on him. Let me put this in in other words for you. As the memes would say, in the kingdom of God, one does not simply climb to the top pedestal and declare themselves supreme. Right? This is not how it works. We can't just climb up there. The, the Olympics are coming up, and a lot of times when we have those Olympic ceremonies, we have the like third, second, and first place pedestals that you can climb up to, and then that's how you can clearly see who won. Well, it's not as simple as like, if you want to win, you just go and stand on that top pedestal. Like That would be amazing, right? Oh, hey, I'm the winner. Like I just climbed up. I was the first one up there. It's just a race to that top pedestal, right? It doesn't work that way. We can't just go climb up there. You have to have earned it somehow. You have to have earned your way up to the top of that pedestal by what you accomplished. But in our case, in the kingdom of God, it's what God accomplished for us. 
and who God is is so much greater than what we could ever be that he's automatically on that top pedestal. We can't, no matter how hard we try, climb up there. But when our heart is postured towards trying to climb up to that top pedestal, that's when we run into problems. That is the kind of pride that God hates because it's not just, it's not an accurate view of our world. And God actively opposes this kind of pride. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. God opposes the proud. Opposes is an active word. God is actively coming against pride in our lives and in our world. And he's showing favor to the humble. That got me thinking this week. It's interesting to just think about this concept of God hating something, that he would hate pride, that he would hate this sin. And I was thinking, what are some of the things that I hate? And uh, I hate to even make myself aware of this, but I hate foam. And I have foam millimeters from my face right now. But just the texture, the feel of it, I don't like it. I, I, I'm like, Caitlin, you got to put that on the mic. Like, I don't, I don't want to touch it, right? I just, there's certain things. Like, I don't like the taste of olives. I, I hate them. I would say it's accurate to say I hate that taste. I hate three-way stops. Can we get an amen for that? I mean, come on. All the time, I just feel like I'm the one on the side where you just wait and watch all the cars go by. Like, they're so privileged and above me. And it's so frustrating. I just hate it. And it's like, could you just put another stop? I, don't know, I get it. I get it. But it's so frustrating, right? And, and those are kind of some fun things. But there's some serious things in our world to hate, too. Uh, when I was in the Twin Cities, there was a wonderful organization there called Source Ministries that works really hard really hard, especially when the Super Bowl came in, to stop the sex trafficking that happens in all the major cities in our country and the abuse that results from that. There's some serious things in our world to hate as well. But any of these things that we think that we hate, it's not anywhere on the level that God hates sin and that God hates pride. God cannot stand a prideful heart. And God wants to bring humility into our lives and into this world because he knows that pride has such a destructive nature. As we talked about before, pride comes before the fall. Pride has the ability to tear things down. It tears down marriages and friendships and churches and teammates and organizations, all kinds of things. A, a few years ago when I was coaching, there was one particular group where we were just having a hard season I remember we called some of the seniors into our office and we just said, hey guys, like, what's going on? You guys doing all right? Like, you know, what are some of the challenges you're facing? <laughs> and I remember we're all packed into this little office. There's like six or seven guys and they all looked at us and in unity said, it's the freshmen and sophomores. They're the problem coach. <laughs> and we're like, oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Way to pass the buck leaders, seniors, you know, like sometimes pride comes in and, and it just tears apart and that team never really quite gelled or had the unity it needed to find success because pride was in the way because there's no way they could point the issue being at themselves. It had to be somewhere else. And to an onlooker, it's so obvious, but sometimes when it's us, we just can't see it, right? And that's the job of a coach. We have to reflect that back so they can see it. But pride gets in the way. It tears things apart. It brings things down. It's at the core of sin, and it keeps people from humbling themselves enough to have the repentant hearts, to have that right posture, and to receive salvation from God. God does not like pride, and it gets in the way of our ability to come before him. But secondly, our second truth of this morning is that humble repentance receives exaltation before God. Humble repentance receives exaltation before God. So what is humility? Let's just talk for a second. What is humility? And again, Mahaney has this fantastic uh, definition for us. He says, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. I love this definition. When I first read it, it was so helpful to me because I feel like I've been fed these unhealthy definitions of humility, maybe grown up in the Midwest, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes I've experienced humility meaning like, you know, you never want to say or admit that you do anything well. Like that's what humility is. Or you just don't want to take ownership or responsibility of any accomplishment. You just don't want the spotlight on you because then you're being prideful. Or sometimes I've been taught like humility is like not wanting the desire to lead because then you're going to be out in front then you're going to have the light on you. Anything that puts the light on you sometimes feels like that's the prideful thing. And I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I love that Mahaney gives this definition, and it comes from Romans 12. He says, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. 
So humility is going, God is so holy, so great, so incredible, and we are sinful human beings who are not on the same pedestal as him, and we should not try to climb up there on our own power. First Chronicles 29 says this about God. It's for us to rightly understand him and where he sits. It says, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. There's that key line. You are exalted, God, as head over all. Humility is rightly understanding and assessing where God is and where we are. It doesn't mean we need to diminish the gifts that God has given us if God calls us to lead, if God calls us to serve, if God calls us to share a story with others of what he has done in our lives. Sometimes I think it's hard for us to desire to even share our story of what God has done in our lives because that means we have to be out in front of others. And I know there's the whole stage fright thing, and I get that, and that's a different category, right? We don't all love to speak in front of other people, share our hearts with them. But humility is not hiding, Humility is understanding who God is and who we are. And I think God calls us even to step into the spotlight and not reflect ourselves, but reflect him to others. That's how he wants to shine his light to the world. Humility is not hiding. Humility is understanding who God is and understanding who we are. And the other thing I want you to know about humility this morning is that the Bible says so clear to us that God helps the humble. I already referenced this passage earlier, but James 4, 6 says, God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. Mahaney says, contrary to popular and false belief, it's not those who help themselves whom God helps. Have you heard that phrase before? Those who help themselves will be helped by God. It's not those who help themselves whom God helps. It's those who humble themselves that God helps. The Bible says God gives grace to to the humble. God gives gifts. He comes alongside. He reveals himself to the humble. It's the humble who can receive salvation from God because only when you have the posture of humility can you possibly repent before God and receive his grace and his love and his salvation in your life. Jesus wants us to see so clearly this morning that whether we are the longtime member or the painter or the tax collector, the Pharisee, whoever we are in this story, It's not about what we've done or what we've accomplished. It's about our posture. It's about our heart. It's about humility and coming before God. And the kingdom of God, the correct posture is humility. So just to review here, this first point, a pursuit of righteousness motivated by pride instead of grace-fueled humility is something that God hates. It's an abomination to the Lord. And the second thing this morning that Jesus teaches us in this story is that humble repentance receives exaltation before God. When we come humbly before God and we repent and we turn from pride and we come to him and we say, God, can you help us? That's when we can receive grace. God gives grace to the humble. He ends this parable with this phrase, I tell you that the tax collector, or I tell you that the tax collector rather than the Pharisee went home justified before God for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Church, I just want to ask you to consider this morning, what is your posture? Are you coming before God in humility? Are you resting on your laurels, your accomplishments, the time that you've put in? Because what God sees is our heart and our posture towards him. So the question I want to ask you is, are you thankful? <laughs> are you, if you're you this morning in a condition where your heart is thankful that you aren't that other guy, you aren't that guy that got pulled over, that you're just going, oh, I'm just so glad I'm not him. Uh, you know, as the, as the Pharisee prayed, like, I'm so glad that I give a tenth of all that I have. I'm so glad that I come and pray regularly. I'm so glad that I'm not that terrible tax collector. If that's our heart then we have the wrong posture this morning and Jesus wants to challenge us. He wants us to not be focused on how good we are or looking down on others or to believe in our accomplishments. And and the thing is, this is such an easy self-assessment. Maybe you've seen those like personality, those assessments online where you can figure out whatever it is, like what house you're in, what personality you have. 
if you want to add to a self-assessment of what is my posture and do I have pride in my life, the answer is basically if your score on this test is above zero, if you feel like any of the accomplishments in your life are adding up so that you can be up next to God on the pedestal, then you have pride to some degree in your life. It's a simple test. But I also want to leave you with a couple thoughts on how do we weaken pride and cultivate humility in our lives? How do we weaken pride and cultivate humility in our lives? One is we just have to keep our eyes on Jesus, on the cross at all times. Now, I know we talk about this a lot, but this is why we come to the Lord's table. Last week, we come to remember what he did because the more often we're looking at what he has done for us, the less often we're going to be focused on what we have done for him. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and on the cross and daily acknowledge in some way our dependence on God and daily express our gratefulness for what he has done for us. One of the simple things I think we can do to have less pride in our lives is just to trust God. And one way we can trust God uh, is by getting sleep and taking rest. I I fall prey to this all the time. How often do you just think, well, I just can't. Like, I can't take the day off. I can't rest. I can't get a good night's sleep because I need to get these things done. They are very important. And if I don't get them done, no one's going to get them done, and I'm not going to be good enough. And, you know, we, we start to build this up in our head. But God says, I need you to trust me. I need you to sleep. I need you to rest. I need you to remember that you depend on me. God wants us to depend on him and to study his word and to be reminded of who he is. And one other thing is to invite and pursue correction. I just want you to consider for a moment, when is the last time that you invited or sought out correction or feedback in your life? Just think about it for a second. Is it too far back to remember? Or was it yesterday? Was it a few weeks ago? Do you have people in your life that you trust enough to come before and say, hey, I'm really looking for some feedback, for some correction. I, I want to get back on the path towards humility, towards the right posture. Can, can you check my posture? Maybe you just go up to someone today after church and be like, can you check my posture? This is why we have the church. This is why we come alongside each other, so we can encourage one another, so we can check on each other, so we can challenge one another. <laughs> and the last one is, and, and this doesn't maybe apply to everyone, but it really does work for everyone. Just play golf as much as possible and you will have humility in your life. I don't know how many of you have experienced this. It is an infuriating sport. Pick that one thing that is just like so hard, no matter how hard you try, it continues to confound you. This will keep humility in your life, and that one works for me. And the last thing is, when you come repentantly and humbly before God, sometimes I come before God and I just say, God, I'm so sorry for my pride. I was able to see it in my life today, to experience it, and I, God, I'm just so sorry for that but I want you to take one extra step when you come before God in repentance about pride. I want you to say, God, I'm sorry for my pride, but also I'm sorry for trying to step up onto that pedestal next to you. I'm sorry for trying to step up on that pedestal next to you on my own. And it's a good reminder of just what is happening when we come before God with a posture of pride. And I want to just conclude this morning with a quote from uh, pastor and author John Stott, and he says, this is so helpful, he says, at every stage of our Christian development and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. In every step along the way, as we talk a lot here about growing spiritually, coming to be more like Christ, And every step along the way, the Bible says that pride is going to be our greatest detriment, our greatest enemy to that growth, and humility, our greatest friend, our greatest aid in becoming like Christ. Our posture in all circumstances should be humility, not pride. Because pride will be that barrier. And humility is so helpful to us to thrive as citizens of the kingdom of God. I hope we consider that this week and be encouraged and challenged by God's word and Jesus' story. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the grace that you extend us in giving us your word. Father, you also give us the church to challenge and encourage one another. 
But God, first and foremost, you give us your word, and I just pray that we would depend on your word, that we would trust it, that we would receive it in a way that convicts our lives, that encourages us and reminds us to be more like you. God, you're so faithful to us. Help us to depend on your faithfulness and your righteousness and not our own. Help us to be grateful and thankful as we come to worship you now. In your name, amen.